Hello, and welcome to REBA. My name is Pete Collard. I'm one of the exhibition curators here at the ROBA, and we're delighted to see so many of you here this evening. Uh, thank you all for joining us and for what is the second of the REBA plus Vitra program of talks called Forms of Exchange, Exploring the Spaces in Between. We're very grateful uh, to host the series together with Vitra. This is the fifth year, uh, fifth consecutive year of the partnership and our program for 2023 will explore how architecture as a practice and profession is shifting, responding to challenges at local and global scale. Throughout the year, the REBA plus Vitra program will invite a range of voices who are leading the way with new processes and practices that are redefining placemaking and the architectural profession, looking to address the question, how does architecture manifest itself beyond the structural form? Some of you have may, may have seen the subject of tonight's talk upstairs in our current exhibition, Long Life, Low Energy, Designing for a Circular Economy. The new Battersea Power Station was included in recognition of its undoubted position as one of the most significant architectural projects of the decade, if not the century to date. A landmark moment in the history of architectural reuse and retrofit, helping the practice become a mainstream, mainstream position rather than the exception. One of the challenges of exhibition curating is that the caption texts are restricted to around 100 words, an impossible task for projects of this scale of importance. So I'm delighted that we can offer Sebastian Ricard from Wilkinson Air uh, the position here on the stage this evening to hear in full the fascinating narrative behind the redevelopment of the Battersea site. To begin, I would like to introduce the chair for the evening, Helen Barrett. Helen is a leading writer on architecture, art, design and popular culture. She's a long-term contributor to the Financial Times and writes also for The Telegraph, The Spectator, among many other publications. She's also the director of London Modern, a new charitable company set up by a group of design and architecture enthusiasts to bring a new cultural festivals to the city. So please do keep an eye out for that uh, in the coming months. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Helen to the stage. Thank you, Pete. Anyone who lived in London for longer than a decade or, decade or so will remember when Battersea Power Station was a derelict enigma. We could see it stranded across the river and the railway tracks when planners were working out what to do with a gargantuan grade two listed Art Deco cliff in a prime part of southwest London. J. Theo Halliday and Sir Giles Gilbert Scott's brick mass on the banks of the Thames had operated for just 50 years. The oldest parts were built in the 1930s. It was finished in the 1950s. And by the early 1980s, it was decommissioned and abandoned. One early idea, a theme park complete with skating rink and roller coaster, got as far as removing the roof to strip out the machinery, leaving it to the foxes, the rain, and the weeds. Perhaps because of its mournful state, Battersea Power Station took root in Londoners' collective imagination as a kind of grand, mute monument to industrial decline. It reopened last year as a mix of luxury flats, shops, offices, a cinema, event space. Some of us may have had misgivings about its new function and the wider Nine Elms development, but many of us were astounded by the remarkable and sensitive transformation of the power station itself. A construction team of 35 people spent a decade restoring the fabric, patching nearly two million new bricks perfectly into the old and retaining the internal features of two very distinct turbine halls, one art deco, one modernist. What's really striking is its gnarliness, the physical evidence of nearly 100 years' worth of scarring, gashes on walls, cracks on tiles. We're almost invited to reflect on how careless we've been with our industrial heritage, though there's nothing pious or even overt about how the scarring is presented. In its first six months of reopening, more than five million people have been to look at it. If every architectural era has its defining building, you could read the transformed Battersea Power Station as the landmark London project to herald a new era of retrofitting. So I'm excited to be joined this evening by Sebastian Ricard of Wilkinson Air, partner and lead architect on Battersea Power Station. Sebastian is French. He has been with Wilkinson Air for over 20 years and a director for 10. 
Before Battersea, he was project architect on the ambitious scheme to transform the Temple Borough Steelworks in South Yorkshire into the Magnus Science Adventure Centre, which won the Stirling Prize in 2001. He designed and completed the Crystal Building in London's Royal Docks, designed to achieve B-R-E-E-A-M outstanding and L-E-E-D platinum. And he led the transformation of the area outside Bath Station, refurbishing the grade, star grade two star listed Brunel building and integrating a public plaza. These diverse projects and many others internationally were the antecedents to Battersea Power Station's restoration, the subject of his lecture this evening. After the lecture, there'll be time to take your questions but in the meantime, please join me in welcoming Sebastian Ricard. Good evening. Thank you, Ellen. So, uh, well, it's obviously um, an enormous privilege and pleasure uh, to be here talking about the, the Power Station, a project which uh, me and 35 colleagues, as Ellen mentioned, in the office have been involved for more than 10 years. An amazing adventure. So, in a way, I'm going to try to talk to you about that adventure uh, in my franglais, as you've noticed, and as Ellen pointed out, I'm a French, so, you know, you might, you might put some franglais in there from time to time. So the first thing really to, to mention is to start obviously with the story of the building. So the building was done in, in two specific areas. The first part, the first half, the western half uh, was done in the 30s and then the second half was done in the 50s and whilst from the outside you wouldn't really spot very strongly the difference, uh, it's another story from the inside so I'm going to come back to that. Of course this is also all about the original architect, Charles Gilbert Scott. So, the reason John Gibbescott got involved in the project is mainly because actually when the people living on north of the river, directly adjacent to the site, uh, the, the well thought uh, and thinking people of South Ken and Chelsea didn't see very well the idea of having an enormous power station on the other side of the river, uh, if, you know, when they were looking at their balcony. So they kind of put a lot of pressure to get someone like John Gibbescott involved to try to spice up the building and try to do a monumental, beautiful uh, piece of uh, infrastructure in the middle of, of London. And so he's been involved and he's designed the external, but the internal of the building hasn't been designed by John Gilbert Scott, so I'm going to come back to that as well. So 1930s part, so just to put that in context, 1930s is the golden era of electricity. Electricity was by then the, uh, the kind of very high-tech new border technology, and that's reflected in the internal architecture, because effectively when you look inside the building, there were magnificent detailing, there were a lot of care, a lot of money spent on it. You've got a lot of marble walls, uh, all the fire and style in the, in the main volume, the turbine hall, which is the building, the, the, the volume on the top here. You've got bespoke fire and style everywhere uh, with bespoke shapes, form, uh, amazing profile. Uh, the control room A, which is a very famous space, has a lot of matter. All the walls are covered in marble. You've got this amazing parquet and golden leaf paint uh, on the steelwork. So a, a lot of amazing detail in there. Then by the time the, the second part was done, which was started just before the Second War and was completed just after the Second War, well, you know, it was part of the day-to-day life of people, electricity. So the, the architecture of the, of the inside is much more of an utilitarian, beautiful steel, modernist architecture. So you've got still beautiful horizontal line and proportion, but you could see that it's, it's done with a, a budget, built to a budget, I would say. Um, but when we got involved in the project, so we won, we won this project for a design competition in the early 2013, but that's what the building looked like by then. And uh, as Ellen mentioned, this is not a very old building. I mean, this is a building which, you know, it's less than, uh, than 100 years old, really, frankly, uh, when you think about, uh, about it, but not your traditional restoration project. And that's as also Ellen mentioned, is because there were a lot of failed attempts to transform the building since it was uh, closed in uh, 1984. And so, but at the same time, this building is a bit magic. I mean, when I, I remember doing the site visit when, uh, when we were shortlisted for the competition and passing the door, because one of the things most of the people who've been in London know about the building, have seen the building from the outside, but very, very few people know the building from the inside. And that's one of the things which really, in a way, it's the most 
amazing story of this development is the fact that now it's open to the public, so people can just enjoy the inside. But one thing which struck me when, when, uh, when I entered the building was actually the, the kind of magnificent craziness of the scale and the derelict aspect of the project, which I find very romantic and beautiful and wanting to make sure that we retain uh, that part, uh, that magic of the building, really. So I'm going to show you now some, some original uh, uh, sketch, all those sketches were done at the competition stage. And, uh, and what they were trying to do is rather than, you know, given a solution for the, the full detail of how we were going to approach the building, it was more about what are the big moves, what are the big things which we think really matter for that project. So the image on the right is this idea of, would it not be great if when you enter the building you've got a kind of you reveal the full internal elevation, full height, and you have even a kind of glance to the, the chimney. Uh, and, and actually, that facade is not over restore. It's you just have that kind of industrial remain, which is there. And then, therefore, you step away the new intervention from the uh, existing facade. The left image, image is turbine ole. It's just this idea that if we're going to do something in those volume, well, we don't want to break that length and that mass. So we want to make sure that there's lightweight bridges, element, put, uh, populating the space, but which don't break the scale of the of the building. And then, as I mentioned, you know, with left-hand side images, even if you are in a kind of new element, well, then you have a glance of, of, of something of the existing. So there is the chimneys that you might discover. And on the right-hand side is this idea that in the main volume, the boiler house, such a big, vast volume, somehow we're going to need to bring, to break it, to break the scale of it, bring natural light in the deep end of it, and maybe also, again, having a glance of the existing facade somewhere. Other story, which is probably not so well known and not so visible, but very important, is uh, the fact that there is massive roof. I mean, this building is 150 meter long by 150 meter wide. So would it not be great also if uh, we can utilize the space and actually bring back and break the scale of that building? Because this is another challenge we had to face as architects, is you have the um, urban scale of that project, which is this massive volume, but then we're trying to find function where people will live, work, uh, experiment the building. So we need to somehow bring the human scale in there. So we came up with this idea of those kind of hidden villa in the sky, as I, as I call them, this idea that you could have those kind of pavilion in the sky just at the base of the chimney. And that transpires also through this idea that if we're going to have 150 meter long by 150 meter wide building, well, can we just create those most amazing garden and try to make them as green as possible throughout uh, the, the roofscape? Because that's an opportunity which is very often missed, is the fact that actually roofs don't need to just keep the water away uh, from the inside of the building. And then in parallel, of course, we needed to foot function in there because, you know, you might be able to do one Tate Modern per country, you know, uh, so you could restore one... Uh, uh, old industrial building and finding a, a, a very beautiful uh, kind of uh, cultural function. But unfortunately, or fortunately, you've got probably 30 or 40 amazing industrial buildings that you need to deal with in every big city. So we needed to find some function which are sustainable for, for the long run on this building. So we had to combine activities such as working place, living space, re recreation space, and retail area. So those were some, some first initial sketches all done by hand. Those were my, my sketches at the time of trying to see how we could place those buildings, how we could subdivide the vast scale of the project to make each of those components not very deep, so you could have natural light in them, which was obviously a challenge uh, within a building which was designed for machine rather than human being, really, in a, to be fair. So what is the project uh, now? Well, this project, the poor station, is one part of a master plan. So it's what we call, or what is called phase two of an overall master plan, which take eight phases and which uh, have a series of uh, buildings surrounding the building. And, and all site, our, our job as architect was to uh, deal with the power station itself, but everything inside what is called the cellar road, the circular road, and what is called North Park, which is this kind of triangular shape uh, park, and including the, the jetty on the north. So the reason I mention all of that is because what is exciting is obviously all the master plan is organized and centered around the power station, but also role as architect, which is not necessarily well known and well visible, is to prepare all the infrastructure for that new 
uh, neighborhood in, in, in London, really, because effectively uh, around the building and uh, the phase two sites or our site is three story of basement everywhere, which is the new infrastructure for the new development. So it's a kind of canary wall scale uh, infrastructure. What that means is you've got effectively underneath this ring road, you have another ring road at B1, basement one, which deliver a uh, car park for all the residents, and then another ring road underneath that level on B2, which bring you to 36 articulated truck bay, which basically allowed to service each of the developments, an enormous infrastructure. And underneath that, you have another ring road, which is actually a savage trench, two meter by three meter, which has all the pipework and duct work, which service all the development. And all that is linked to a 7,000 square meter um, energy center underneath the park, which basically does the cooling and the heating for all the development. Why? Because the, 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 uh, obviously, being central London, all the, uh, all the services were saturated, all the grid was saturated, so we needed to create our own energy on site. So what the brief is now, uh, it's 35,000 square meter of retail area cutting across the two main turbine hall, which I showed some historic image earlier on. And that's about 120 shops. To give you an idea of scale, this is about a third of Westfield, West London. Then above that, in the main volume, what is called the boiler house, which is the, bo the, 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 the building uh, in between the four cheminées, is six story of office area. So that's the blue color here. So that six story of office area provides 45,000 square meter of offices. Again, to give you an idea of scale, this is the scale of the Gherking. And that's about 35% of the overall area in the building. And uh, so you put the, you, you basically, because the building is 150 meter long, you put the gherking horizontally, you squash it a bit and it fit in that space. Then, then the, uh, in purple here, you've got the residential component. So within the two existing flanked building, uh, which are called, which are east and west, uh, you've got five story of residential property within the existing fabric and three story of extension each time. So that's about 100 units on either side. And then you've got 34 uh, villas and flat on the top. And sandwiched between the office and the retail, you've got the event spaces. So there's an event space for about 1,500 people and a, a mini multiplex cinema in there. Plus the cherry on top of the, of the cake, there is a, a, a platform lift uh, public accessible in the northwest chimney, giving you one, a 360 view uh, of London. So just the uh, detailed design and development of the project. Well, it's one thing to try to have all those great ID and to uh, try to have a brief that you've agreed with the client, but how are we going to deal with this building and the state of that building? Uh, so the first thing we did was to create a, a 3D cloud survey for the full building, so, which is amazing because that's a technology we didn't have a few years back and it's been incredibly helpful to us. So it allows us to basically create a kind of photographic report or 3D report of the existing fabric and all the components, all the equipment in there and to catalog all of them and to make sure that we have a record for every room in the building of what we could do and what was there before. So those are kind of magic uh, kind of screenshot of the 3D model we had the 3D clean. And then after doing that, they basically help us to do another kind of journalistic uh, report document which catalog all the different typology of restoration work. So whether we're talking about a, a, a concrete element like, that, like the bottom of the bow win bay window or how do we deal with the restoration of the, of the fire and style or how do we deal with the restoration of the steel work. So basically classifying all the different technology, all the different material and what strategy we're, we were going to deal with. Obviously, I'm going very quick on that, and there's thousands and thousands of drawings. We've produced something like 13,000 drawings as architect on this job only. Um, and this, then we, column by column, area by area, we produce those kind of markup drawing, uh, defining what was going to be restored, what was going to be repaired, what was going to be replaced based on the, on the state of the component, and of course, we wanted to retain this industrial film, so it wasn't about making this building look like a fresh new building. It was about having a very sensitive approach to what would be good to keep a scar. You know, you were talking about the scar of the building, and, and this is something which we felt was very important to retain. And then only by, by the time we have done all of that, we can start to think about new intervention. So I just put out, pull out this drawing from us, just saying that, for instance, within the retail area, that's only after doing all the repair work, then you can start to think about what are the new elements. So it's, it's a very layered approach uh, that you have to do. So now I'm going to speak about some of the key components of the, of the design. 
starting with the Arrival front. So starting from the main uh, volume of, effectively there's two main entrances to the building, one from the north, uh, from the river, and one from the south. So the south is basically on two levels. The reason for that is because between Nine Elms, which is the main run below, and the river, there's a kind of six meter height difference. And the other reason is we needed to protect the building uh, against the 100 years flooding level. So we raised the ground floor of the building about four and a half meter from its original level to protect it. So when you come by tube with a new tube uh, stop, you would come at low level here, but also if you're drop off by, uh, by a cab or if you come a cyclist, you will come at high level, so you can enter at both level. And so, so on the south side, the first thing we had to do is a piece of infrastructure. So this is actually a sculpture uh, we created, which we call the turbine, which was actually a very utilitarian way of hiding a series of extract systems from the basement. And we, we basically came up with this idea of bringing a bit of movement and a reminder of what the building was about. So this idea of creating a, uh, a moving uh, piece of urban sculpture, really, which was designed in 3D, obviously, with a lot of uh, CNC cuts, so kind of computer generated um, metal cut piece of plate, which were fabricated by a company called Little Hampton in, the, in, the, in South England, which is an amazing company doing magic things with, with steel. Uh, so it was, it was really good fun to go and see how that was fabricated. Then the other, obviously, main entrance is the piazza, which we call Malaysian Square. One thing I obviously didn't mention earlier on is the fact that this project and the client is a Malaysian-funded um, uh, set of, of funder and so one of the things which were we, which we all felt was uh, very important obviously is to is to find a key place in the building where we can mention the fact that they were there and you know the fact that they are the the saver of the of the building, really. So we to respond to the formality of the building and this kind of verticality, we thought that we needed to find a, a very contemporary but very formal way and very geometrical way of responding to the to the building, which is why we came up with this idea of a whoops, sorry, with this idea of a kind of squashed uh, oval shape, uh, helping to create this kind of Spanish steps uh, environment, ideal for creating some event and artist intervention in the middle and creating an active entrance piazza. And that was a bit of fun, uh, playing with the layering and playing with this idea of that stair and the fact that the stair could become the walls. Um, so we, we, we looked at different granites, so it's all done in granite, so those are a series of layer granite, all coming from Europe, so not far away from the, from the, from the site itself. And then we, we just, this is just to show some of the, uh, the, this project is all about micro and micro. So it was very key that even if the scale of the building is obviously enormous, we also take care of the of the detailing, and we wanted to make sure that it was visible everywhere. So we spend a lot of a lot of time exploring everything. An example here is how do you deal with movement joint in a shape like that? So you know this is kind of a mock-up on how we can uh, basically discard the movement joint within the overall construction, and of course those will be filled with with a silicon joint, so you wouldn't uh, see the movement joint. So that was just a, a quick example, and then that's those are some of the image, and this and this design. Basically basically stopped up by having a mirror finish surface so underneath what we call the yellow road bridge, allowing to have this kind of infinity relationship between the wall, the stair, and you, you lose a bit the perception of space. And then we have this very slim bridge suspended and supported on either side, and just uh, creating this kind of very light entrance. And this is some of the photos. This, this is a photo taken on the opening day, actually. So on the other side, on the north side, well, this is a very different approach because on the north side, this is the facade that most of the people would have known and explored the most because this is the backdrop to all those amazing projections on the wall for years when the building wasn't in use. So our approach was really much about, very much about keeping it as open as possible, as visual as possible, and making sure that the member of the public could come and touch the building. So we, we, we came out with this idea of a very uh, simple uh, landscape scheme, uh, mainly uh, a soft landscape and, uh, and green space designed with, uh, uh, in collaboration with LDA. And the idea, yes, is exactly is that is to, is to be able to, to explore the, the, the facade from the north of the river or from any angle. And, but all that, and this is story of having those projections, those magic moments on the facade, well, we set up also need some infrastructure. So we, we created this kind of 
a kind of magical uh, big terrace on level two, which is directly um, on the same level than the event space. So if you have a breakout moment in the event space, you can, you can come out. Uh, but also, this is basically part of the infrastructure to allow to have those magical moments, because of course, it just means that you can have projector, you can have a lot of components, you can have sculpture, an element helping that to create the magic. So the retail area, I mentioned that it's the, uh, cutting across the two turbine hall. So it's a, it's a very simple set of shops, effectively, opening up and facing the turbine hall with service corridor at the back to make them uh, viable. So in turbine hall A, what we've done uh, is bringing the shop on lower level inside the volume, allowing us to use the front part of the roof of the shop as a kind of circulation, main circulation on level above, and then creating another walkway on the first floor. And cutting the main volume by just, as I mentioned earlier, on some lightweight bridges and escalator, just vertical circulation. But one thing to, to, to mention is the, none of the new component element we, we've created there could be supported by the existing fabric. The existing structure was basically, uh, could only support its own weight. So we're creating an awful lot of new activity and we did it to create a totally independent structure. So all those walkways and uh, basically needed to be supported by a new structure inside the boiler house. So this is a photo on site showing effectively all those can delivering piece of structure, which are not small because they can deliver about five meter wide walkways, are basically fixed back to a set of beams behind the line of existing column, which are then supported by what I could call a twin set of column, so a new set of steel column behind the existing structure to allow to have all those new activity totally independent from the existing structure. So quite a complex kind of piece of jigsaw and we're using as much as possible of the existing foundation because we had the luck of having a building which was designed for big machinery, which was full of big concrete foundation everywhere. So we could combine them and working very hard with Bureau Paul, with the structural engineer, to, to, to reuse as much as we could of the existing foundation. And that's some of the shots of those kind of detailing. I mentioned the micro and the micro. We spend a lot of time shaping up all the steelwork, uh, tapering them, creating this kind of cruciform like column uh, scape, scale to just create a vocabulary which responded to the original architecture. The other thing I can mention is also the, the shop front. Uh, are designed as what we call a uh, kind of portal. And what we did is created this kind of metal portal between the existing listed fabric and the glazing. And the, the reason for that is, is to ensure that at any time in the future, if there is any change needed for, the, for, for any retailer, if they need to change a door, to change a component, which happened already, for instance, because we have a car showroom in there, so they needed wider door, then any of that work could be done without touching the existing listed fabric. So it kind of give a good... Uh, being a great star uh, listed building, we designed all the shop front. They are all the same. And there were a lot of very stringent rule about the branding. You know, as you can see, they are monochrome on the, on the turbine olay. And even the drop-down sign, we designed them. And we had a bit of fun, of course, so we, we, uh, we kind of wanted to uh, remind ourselves of some of the, uh, of the component of the building and, and use some of those uh, components. So for instance, this is how we reuse one of the existing gantry beam, which obviously was designed to carry a massive load for uh, replacing some component of the turbine. And we use that opportunity to suspend a, suspend a lightweight bridge, footbridge, linking the event spans to control room A. Uh, so that's, and it's just twisted shape because actually the two area we were listing, we were linking, sorry, uh, were not exactly aligned in plan. And uh, so this is just some of the shots on site of how to create this super lightweight uh, structure, very minimal structure. And it's great to see that it's already been used for photo shoots, so it's great to see that it's, it's already uh, a place which is loved. So I spoke about the detailing. Uh, the last thing we wanted is to create the kind of retail environment which looked like it could be anywhere and it could be a new retail environment. So we developed a strategy for having uh, Balustrating detail, which are not glass, as you would normally have to deal with in a, in a retail environment. Most of the time when you do a retail scheme, people tell you, oh, it has to be glass because the retailer will hate to have that shop behind and so you can't see their front edge. And we've managed to convince everybody that actually maybe we could do something a bit more different. And so we looked at the kind of metal bar system, a metal blade system, and by designing only five different profiles, so we've cutting them with different shape, we actually tried to give a bit of a reminder of some of the original details. So this is still in existence in some of the kind of balcony which are not accessible for public. So we kind of created a visual effect 
of, uh, of this kind of shape, this kind of a shape, uh, by just playing a bit with, uh, with those kind of uh, metal bars. So we did, this was a photo of, of uh, some of the model we did as a prototype, and this is some of the side photo, which show how effective that is. So a bit of fun, really. Control room A, magic space, uh, which really show, as I mentioned earlier on, the fact that it was a, a ground space, and in the 30s, that was a, a, electricity was something that people were proud of, proud of, and the people working there were very uh, high, uh, high skilled people. Uh, that building was in a pretty poor state, uh, that room, sorry, was in a pretty poor state when we got involved, but very famous and used in some really well-known movie like the, the King's Speech, for instance. And it was all about how do we recreate that space and there, how do we do a very much in-depth restoration set of work. So, for instance, we repainted all the frame. This is one of the only places where we've managed to retain the glazing because it's single glaze, and we've managed to retain the frame because the frame was in a good state. Most of the other places, the frame was totally deformed and not, uh, we were not capable. All the dials, we've managed to replace all the missing dials. We've managed to replace all the kind of electric uh, light box on the top and all the glazing on the top, which was painted during the Second World War to avoid uh, being visible from the Germans. Uh, we replaced all the panel and, and decontaminated all the panel. And that's to bring it back to its uh, former glory. So those are just some shots of the turbine Olay now in use. So. I will encourage you to have a look there if you haven't been, but I'm sure most of you would have, would have gone there. So Turbine Olby, as I mentioned, a very di different animal, a very different architecture. This image, in a way, is misleading because you have a lot of natural light coming down here, but it's only natural light because by the time we got involved, the roof of the boiler house was gone, but that space never saw any natural light in use. So it's a very similar strategy of bringing shops inside, engaging with the space, and also uh, basically bringing walkway and, and horizontal crossing uh, throughout the space. A bit of detail as well, speaking about the micro and the micro and the history. The kind of footprint you have, which this was an image we did at the time, is actually the original footprint of the turbine. So we've made a change of material and finish on the floor to kind of bring a bit of memory of what the building uh, were used for historically. So those are some images. And in the middle of that space, you've got control room B. And what is interesting is to see that what was control room A, which was a 70 meter long space to control the same amount of turbine, you know, in 30 years down the road or 25 years down the road, was converted in a small room, which is only 20 meter wide, because that was controlling exactly the same amount of turbine and arguably turbine which were more efficient and giving more power. Uh, very different architecture, but what we wanted here, because it was in the middle of the, of the turbine hall, we wanted to create a kind of focus point, focal point, and making sure that actually people who come in the retail can engage with that space rather than being a st uh, step away. So this is why we created these bridges to have a bit of an amphitheater in the middle of the space. And this is some of the image. We kind of, for a long, long time, with we, uh, all the people working on the scheme, we call it the kind of Doctor Who space, because it gives a bit that kind of fl flavor. And that was an early image we showed to try to see how much interaction could we bring between the, the control panel and the member of the public. Again, a very in-depth restoration work there. We did, we, we, we dis well, decontaminated all those panels, dismounted everything, uh, repaired everything which was broken, repolished all the stainless steel component panel. So they're very much in-depth work. And then some of the uh, photo now, so people can have a drink and have some food just directly engaging with this control panel. And it's very, I mean, I had the, 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 the grandfather, the father of my, of my wife actually, who came and visited and he was amazed. He used to work for an electric company and he was amazed to see those big control panels. So I didn't realize that it could become so magical for some people actually, the fact of being able to see so he, he knew exactly what ampere were uh, on each of the control panel, which is something I wouldn't know, just because of the scale of the button and things like that. So it was really great to see that something which is normally not visible could be uh, on shore like that and, and bring the memory to people. So this is another special space. It's another kind of controlled visual room uh, in the north wall of Turbine B. And I've, uh, I've attached those two drawings because I wanted to mention that a project of that scale, complexity, historic nature, and, and a kind of derelict nature also meant that it's not a, um, a project where you can draw everything, design everything, and then say that's it. Go to the contractor and say now build it and just repair it as it is. And a lot of time we had to change a bit or, or uh, 
or philosophy of what we were going to do based on when we were opening things and discovering how bad or how well uh, uh, maintained was each of the combatants. And this is a bit of a success story because we, f we thought at the beginning we were never going to uh, restore that work. As you can see, it's pretty heavily uh, corroded all the steel work and the frame. But we've managed to justify with Bureau Paul that actually the, the millimeter uh, of steel removed by the corrosion uh, was so thin that actually we could still justify retaining the structure and retreating it. So that was good news. And so, and all those things were done by free and sketch on site by talking to the contractor. And that's a result, repainting it with the original color. Another piece of fun to just bring, bring back a bit the memory and the twist on the, on the industrial heritage. We thought, you know, why not bring in a bit of a movement, uh, something which can move in that space to remind us that, you know, this country crane used to move. So we created what we call this bandstand, this kind of uh, uh, glass box, which effectively can move up and down in the space, can dock on different level and can be used for, you know, I don't know, cocktail party for launching a, a new product in one of the retail, or, or you can use, you know, you can put a car if you want to display a car and, and you will see a photo of Genesis, who is one of the uh, car uh, company in the, in the building who's, who's launched one of their car in there. Or it could be an artist intervention. And it's all set up as a glass box, which has also an LED mat matrix on it. So you can basically uh, also project an, uh, on the box itself. So you could see, and that was in use by Genesis, who has got a showroom uh, on the ground floor, which for the people who don't know Genesis is one of the uh, purely electric car company. I mentioned the fact that this building never had any natural light. So we designed, we created in what used to be all those extract system uh, ventilation, we actually uh, transformed them into light tubes with reflector on them. And so from the park that we've created on the top of the roof of Turbine LB, you've got a two and a half meter deep set of cylinder which basically bring natural light to the space. So what you see there is not artificial light, it's just purely the sun coming down. So they are very effective. And, uh, and so we did a lot of work of you know, prototyping and, and developing the, the, the strategy on how we could get the best lighting effect. And this is all those elements here that you see inside that beautiful park. We just bring that material light and those are some images showing you the effect you bring. So they combine with a, uh, an artificial light system as well. So at night, you can also use them as artificial light. But what you see here is the natural light coming right down. So it's pretty effective for, for something which is relatively small. The boiler house uh, itself. So I mentioned the fact that you know we 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 uh, we came up with this idea of this kind of full height atrium space at the beginning. So this is a bit of an evolution and how we explore that building. How can we retain that kind of decade derelict facade, but you know which was restrained by slab at every level historically. But by the time we were there, there were no slab left. So we needed to somehow find a way of restraining the facade, and we wanted to do it in a way that we wouldn't. Uh, uh, basically overpower the structure. So we use a, a bowstring system, which is normally a very thin cable system to support facade normally. And, and here we converted it to support uh, to glazing. And here we converted it to support brick. And again, you know, the care of the detailing. So making sure that, and those are some of the photo of the thing and, and some of the view of the entrance now. North side, something even more pregnant, the, 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 the aspect of retaining the memory and the history. You know, we definitively didn't want it to over restore the building. We just left it and just make sure we secured all the facade itself and so nothing will fall off. But apart from that, we've left it as it was, pushing everything away from it, so all the new interventions so you could always have a contact. And this is a view from down the main stair. So you could see you always have contact with the visual fabric, with the existing fabric, sorry. The event space, so sandwich between the office and the retail. So a major challenge there, because creating a, a big room like that, colon free, so making sure that you don't have uh, something between you and, uh, and someone on the stage, is very important, obviously, in the event space. But it's not so easy when it's suspended in the, uh, above a free level of retail, and when you have six story of office <coughs> plus two story of resi on top. So we came out with this idea of the tree, structural tree, which is a triple height uh, set of, of well, two, two uh, colon, which basically transfer one colon into six of the office grid and the office grid colon are about 30, 13 by 11 meter apart. So a, a big uh, complex structural challenge allowing you when you enter uh, in the, at the space and come at this level to have this very sculptural element. And then when you are inside the, the, uh, the room, the other thing we wanted is to create a window. So again, you always have a visual contact to the existing fabric even when you are in the event space. And this is some of the shots on site of those uh, structural elements, which are pretty magical. I mean, those were with the primer color before they were painted, because the final color is black. But it just gives you an idea of scale. 
And this is some of the views. So we're fitting out that space at the moment. So I can't show you fi uh, you know, fitted out space, but this is, this is the view of the entrance. And inside, again, how do you create a, a window into an event space which needs to be acoustically treated, mean that you have to deal with some interesting detail and we've created those kind of glass reflector allowing us to balance back the sound. The office space, another major component, as I mentioned. The very unusual thing about that office space is two probably elements. One is the scale of it. This is 7,500 square meter uh, floor plate. Uh, I don't think there's anything comparable in the UK that I can think of for an office space, even in Canary Wharf. You know, the big tower would probably be a half of a third of that floor plate. So something amazing, a kind of empty canvas, which is perfect when you want very flexible space and to do something interesting with it. Uh, the other very unusual space is this office development has no frontage on the outside. So effectively, the entrance is a, a very modest 250 square meter uh, lobby, directly surrounded by retail uh, unit. And then you take a set of wall climber lift, which bring you to a sky lobby on level five, which then deliver you a series of other wall climbing uh, lift, serving each of the level. So that's very interesting. Something, the typology you might see in, in Asia, but very unusual in Europe or in North America to have kind of major office development with no front edge, no uh, front door effectively. And that's just a view of that, uh, of that lobby. This is this lobby inside. Uh, and then we've played a lot with the, the design of the stair to try to hide the more practical escalator, because we're not a big fan of uh, you know, escalators, so we like to hide them or to integrate them in the design. So we use kind of vertical line, a bit reminder again of the kind of verticality of the architecture of Gilbert Scott to integrate those elements. So those are some uh, shots of the. So I'm pointing out some of the elements. So this is the scale of the space inside. So. Another element I wanted to mention is when you deal with a project of that scale, the flexibility and the evolution and the evolutivity of the scheme is very important. Why? Because what you design in day one might not be built exactly as you've done it uh, for obvious reason and practical reason. And of course, when we design that building, 45,000 square meter of offices, we never thought that there would be one tenant uh, taking it. So we've designed it as a multi-led space. So we've internal glazing on either side of that central atrium. So you could subdivide the space so a, a tenant could take one one floor or one wing or a few floors and another turn could put over the spaces. So this is an image we had at the beginning and uh, which evolved because when Apple who have signed and taken the full uh, space are basically ask us to reopen all the space. So now it's a series of effectively glass balustrade with open spaces because it's one tenant. And this is just a, a scale of the, of the space. And we've reused the chimney and what we call the wash tower as the main core and created four new core. And everything else is flexible. And obviously, this atrium space is massive. It's 80 meter long atrium space, 25 meter wide. So I'm talking here about the scale of a, a traditional London street and actually a pretty major London street. And that's only half of the height of the building before you get to the chimney height. And this is just an image we did a, a long time ago, but just to show how we were, had to play with the existing fabric. And here we created those kind of uh, window slots uh, respecting the, the original architecture to allow for the two top level of the office to have natural light. Because if we didn't do that, there wouldn't be any natural light in that part. And this is just some side shot which show the, uh, the scale of the building. And again, we had to put new uh, structure here throughout because that was just a big empty volume by the time we were there. And this is an image uh, of the fit out done by uh, Foster. So we've done all the shell and core and Foster have done the fit out for the Apple space. And again, to talk about the detailing, so we deliver those lift for, for Apple. And this is just to show you the level of care. There's 72 lift on, the, on this project. So residential element. So as I mentioned, is they are you know, in the two uh, wing of the, of the building plus on the top of the building. And, they, and they, are, they all have gardens, so they all have communal garden on the top of the turbine olay and B roof, and three level of extension above those roof level. And then the, the boiler house villa, as we call them, are basically uh, around the central atrium of the office space below and a communal garden. And this is one of the images I mentioned earlier on, and one of the things that I'm kind of proud of is this idea of that, you know, as you can see on this image, is mainly green. And that's fantastic to think that we can convert uh, uh, an historic fabric like that with so much greenery and proper trees. We're talking about proper tree. The added benefit beyond the, uh, obviously, the amenity space we create is the fact that we've uh, totally transformed the insulation of the building by doing so, because we've created a half a meter, uh, effectively, a hearth 
uh, insulation throughout all the spaces, we'd create a much better environment for the building inside and reduce the energy needed for the building. So the Boiler House Villa and Trends on the Resi, they have those magic kind of lobby, 24 story high, uh, with a wall climber lift cutting across existing structure and with a sky lobby, which is the base of the chimney. We for three of them, except the one with the platform lift, a full view right up to the top of the chimney. It's a bit of a magic moment. It's a bit of a Blade Runner moment, you know, this kind of a structural glass lift cutting across, very sleek glass lift cutting across rusty steel. And that's what it is, you know. We, so wherever we needed, we, we basically intermiss and paint the steel when it needed to be fire-rated. Everywhere else, we retain it with just a transparent seal, and we retain the rustiness. So those are some of the sides. And this is the, 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 the end result. So playing with you know, a combination of new component, existing component, never ever restore them when we didn't need it to. And this is the sky lobby when you arrive with the exposed concrete of the chimney and kind of recreating with marble strip some fluting of the, of the space. And this is some of the shots and detail again, you know, how we could bring back the letter box and integrate them within existing fabric. And this is this hidden world on the top, so bringing back some human scale by actually everybody who's got their own house effectively, you can read them as houses rather than big uh, component. Those were some original images. So that was a project on his own, effectively, because the logistic of having to build all of that right up on the top of the building was his own project, really. You had to bring all the components on the top and then move them around. So quite a complex set of uh, images. And on the outside is this idea of having a very simple, sleek glass facade, which responds to the urban scale of the building, which then, uh, on the inside, gets subdivided and create this kind of magic world, which you, know, you wouldn't know you're on top of the power station there. So a very unusual setup. And this is some of the view of those villa and the fact that you have your kind of private roof garden at the base of the chimney is a bit of an interesting moment. Switch house west, so one of the volume, creating that drama of, of a very formal architecture, very formal entrance, with creating all the slot window all the way through to bring natural light in the building, which were not there to, for the flat. And again, a combination of existing, not over restore, exposed as it was with new component. And, uh, and self-finished material like, you know, for instance, the entrance portal are, are kind of rusty steel component. And we've reused, I mean, here for understand, we had board mark finish concrete for the support concrete core. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the lobby entrance and the corridor are basically against the control room A wall, so exposing all the historic fabric and creating a three-story high atrium space with kind of over oversized door, entrance door, change of floor finish to create something a bit special every time you have an entrance to a unit. The palette of finishes inside, so we developed that palette of finish with uh, Michael Esboy, who was the concept architect for the inside of the, of the residential uh, unit. And so, you know, re rethinking of using crypto glaze system, kind of glaze, tile system, and obviously uh, one of the key moves was we wanted to expose the brickwork on the inside of the flat, so every flat has the external wall with the exposed original brick in there. And those are some of the views, so every time you're gonna, you've got some existing fabric always visible. And this is some photo of the roof garden above Turbine Olay. And again, this idea that the duplex on the top you can, are subdivided and bring some human scale, and you can read the scale of each of the unit. Three charts west, three charts east, sorry. So on the other side, the other volume, uh, an another massive volume. So this is the back wall of control room B, and that's why you've got all the remaining of the historic slab there, because that control room B is at different level than everywhere else. And where we had a bit of fun of uh, transforming the use of some of the existing gantry beam and using them as, a, for instance, here as a reception desk. So what we did is we catalogued some of those beams that we needed to cut in the wash tower and carefully store them and, and reuse them. We've also cut some smaller parts to, to create some low-level uh, table in, the, in some of the reception space. So it was a bit of a, a logistic uh, challenge to bring them back in. And we had to bring them very early on before any fit out because of the load of it. And we had to create a concrete footing to, uh, to put it in here. And those are some of the finished photos showing the combination of all this exposed derelict architecture against very sophisticated set of components. Another thing I didn't mention, throughout the building, all the services are exposed, even in the residential elements. So all the pipe work, all the steel work are usually just behind uh, a, a very transparent mesh system. And even in the residential corridor, they are like that. And people seem to really like that. And then when I mentioned the reuse of some of the steel components, you can see that there on one of the small level desks. We also had to deal with the challenge of those massive volume in the residential element, and so we kind of created those kind of internal courtyard to make sure that the flat were not too deep. And it was again an excuse for reusing some of the existing components and creating some kind of sculptural spaces within those gardens. 
And then the last piece uh, to, uh, to mention in the, in the, uh, is this kind of magical moment of this, uh, of this cheminée lift experience, which is a bit of a technical challenge because A, the, uh, the cheminées are conic, so they, 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 they're not the same footprint at the bottom that on the top, so getting a, a lift to work in a conic shape is not so easy. Also, what you want to make sure is if people go there and there is anything which break or a poor cut, you can evacuate them. So, the, uh, so and before we could do any of that, we had to rebuild the cheminée. So the cheminée were totally corroded from the inside. So they were built as a very high-tech uh, construction at the time because they were built out of uh, reinforced concrete, 200 millimeter thick reinforced concrete. So thinking of in the 30s, building a 50, a 50 meter high uh, set of uh, component architectural component with only 200 millimeter thick component. This phenomenal actually, incredibly high tech at the time. The downside of that is all the reinforcement, uh, because of the toxic fume going through it for years when it was in use, was exposed on the inside and corroded. So there was no way we could give new accommodation and guarantee for all those new accommodation with those very um, uh, weak chimneys. So we had to rebuild them. And then after rebuilding them, then we had to create effectively a lift in the lift. So thing that people will not know when they go there is actually you will spend all your time in that top part, but actually there is a secondary lift inside, which means that in case of failure or breaking down, you basically can come down and everybody can be evacuated safely in a backup lift, so a bit of fun. Uh, and all the control system are hidden into that bench in the middle. So nobody knows that when you go there, but actually there's a lot of technology in there. And this is just some of the view of that. Uh, that uh, a very transparent element and some of the view you can get. I mean, if you haven't done it, it's, I mean, you have to choose your day well because if the weather is not brilliant, it could be quite cloudy. But if the weather is nice, it's phenomenal because most of the high point in the, typically in London are toward the city. So you're in the city looking out. But here, what is great is, is you're on, on one of the only high points on that side of, the, of London and you look toward the city. So it's a very magical moment and, and view. So now I wanted to, to finish off with talking about a few key aspect of the project beyond the, the activity inside the building. The one which fantastic and, and amazing story is obviously the, the restoration work of the, of the facade. And this is some of the view, so it's, a bit, it's, a, it's not very uh, focused, but a view of the historic fabric and the fact that we've integrated some new window, but also the fact that there's 12 different blend of brick on this building. So 12 different color, all imperial size brick. So we needed to find a supplier who could remake a 12 different color blend and match the blend, the historical blend, and match the size. We were lucky enough to find back the original supplier, North Court, uh, to, to refabricate those blends. And each of those blends, by the way, are different on each facade because they were built at different moments. So it's not good enough to match one facade and, and the mix of color. You have to do that. So we did one-to-one -one mock up of two by three meter and trying to demonstrate how we would blend the coloring for each of the facades. The other exercise, of course, is all the grouting, which again is different from one facade to the other, and was about trying to get all the right pigment to make sure that you could demonstrate, you could you know, match the coloring and the strength of the, of the grouting from, uh, from the original one. We also use very uh, contemporary innovative technology in places, so those are the boiler uh, house wall. So when we got involved, one of the walls already collapsed, so it wasn't there. The other one was, li was listed after six months we got involved as a dangerous structure by uh, building control local authority. So we, it was very, very difficult to justify how we could repair it and restore it. So we ended up having to knock it down and to rebuild it. So what we did is we, we worked with a company called Forp to develop this precast concrete panel system, we've embodied real brick into it. So effectively, they are real brick, and what we've managed to do is to salvage a lot of the uh, removed brick, especially the one of kind of uh, shaped one, of curved one, to reintegrate them into the mold and to, into the existing facade. And that allows us to have an amazing kind of quality of work, and all of the joints of the panel are invisible. You wouldn't know there is any joint in the panel. So uh, an amazing story. It's, this is built 25 meter up in the air, 150 meter long facade very windy. If we had to do that in an old-fashioned way and lay brick by brick, it would have taken probably three or four uh, times longer to build it and the quality wouldn't have been as good. 
And this is some of the shots showing some of the end result, uh, which show yeah, that actually this building is coming back to life. And, and you barely see now the, the junction between the old and new. You can still see it, but it's already much less visible now than it was a year ago. And within a year, you will not notice what is new and what is old. And this is just showing some example of new openings throughout. So when we have, we have different vocabulary of window, we've got kind of critical glazed window when those, when those uh, window were actually inexistent, a small window, and we've extended them. And when they are totally new, we've created a more contemporary vocabulary to make sure that people know what is new, fully new intervention, and what was kind of uh, amendment to an existing principle. So I'm going to finish off on the uh, kind of logistical part of the project, because beyond the pure architecture of it, or, or you, would, you could argue it's massive part of the architecture. Uh, this was an enormous undertaking. This is a photo showing up to 18 crane on this site at one point in the site. So 18 crane on the face to the power station site itself at the time where in the city you had less crane overall in the overall London city than on that site itself. And this is how we just were allowed to enable us to decontaminate the turbine hall. So those were scaffolding put for decontaminating the building and only when the decontamination was done, well, all those scaffolding were contaminated by them. They had to be all taken down, and we had to put new scaffolding for doing all the repair work. And then when we were doing all the repair work, then we had to take it down for then again being able to build on the new intervention. So a kind of really big undertaking. There's a lot of uh, a big contract on, the, on scaffolding on this job, that's for sure. Um, so I'm a big contractor, probably. The, uh, also, things like this is a 62-ton beam which is a transfer beam supporting the north uh, atrium uh, office space, all in one beam. Uh, we were told is the uh, heaviest beam ever carried out by one crane uh, in Europe for the past 50 years, because normally those beams of that scale are spliced, but this one came as one uh, unit because of the strength it needed to carry, so it couldn't be spliced. This is also just showing the scale of some of the conduit and component. Uh, six of them are back into the cheminée. So if you're lucky and if it's a nice uh, day, you will see some, some uh, clean smoke coming out of it. So it's brilliant to see that the power station is back to pouring the building. And this is some of the infrastructure components. So this is one of the basement corridors showing you the scale of, of element that nobody will see, but which help the full development to function. So it's a, it's a real machine, really. And a bit of fun, this is one of, uh, one of our guys who worked on the project for four years in the office who did a bit of a selfie to show you the kind of magic uh, of this project even during site construction. And to finish off, uh, just hopefully, you know, in a humble way, if we've managed to keep this kind of iconic nature of the building, I think that's probably the best thing we could have done because I think the more daunting things when I entered the building before we started to get involved was the fact that this building was magical and uh, we wanted to make sure that making it sustainable for the future was also retaining this kind of magic with it. So thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. That was a huge privilege to see those images and listen to your lecture. Um, I'm going to throw... Uh, throw open questions in a moment. But before I do, I'm really curious because, like you, I didn't grow up in London. I'm not from London. But I did know Battersea Power Station. I was familiar with it. And the reason why I was familiar with it, with it was because of uh, Pink Floyd's animals <laughs> and algae, the inflatable pig. It was, in 1976, was tethered to the, the front of the building. Mm -hmm. Um, and used in, on that album cover as that image. Um, it was a comment, it was intended to be a comment on capitalism. Mm -hmm. The pigs have the power, a clunking, clunking metaphor. But I wondered, how aware were you, um, before you worked on Battersea, how aware were you of the significance of Battersea Power Station in the popular imagination and in popular culture? Well, I was definitely fully aware of it. And actually, as I mentioned earlier on, it's probably one of the most daunting things that I felt by entering the building and trying to tackle how to think of restoring it, putting new function in it. How do you deal with the fact that this is a magic building? I, 
I use sometimes this kind of romantic rune. The fact that it was a rune for so many years, that there were so many failed story with it, probably it's part of the magic of that building. The fact that actually for 30 years, you had crazy event happening there. You had people climbing the building, you had projection on the wall, you had, I don't know, motorbike racing, cross racing around the building, on top of the building. And, and all of that was part of that pop culture and this, the fact of, of uh, being on the cover of Pink Floyd. So, and, and, and actually being a French, uh, person, the first moment I arrived in London at the time where uh, the Eurostar used to stop at Waterloo, the first thing you saw was actually the chimney of the power station. So I was very much aware, and at the time, it was at the time where people were starting to talk about what was going to happen with Tate Modern and the other power station on the east of London. So it was very much into our, all our mind that it's that we needed to try to get it right and to give it justice on this building. And it was on, not only about uh, finding a sustainable use for the future, but retaining that magic. And that was very daunting, because how do you do, do it, and what are the ingredients which make it magic? And that's, that's why maybe we, we kind of looked at those, those elements, such as retaining the kind of industrial nature, the der derelict aspect in places, and the sense of scale, because those are part of the magic of that building. And retaining this kind of open facade on the end, because if anything, you want to make sure that there's always a moment where at the scale of the city, you have big vesta to the building, because that's also part of that magic moment. I mean, if you, if you come from Sloan, Sloan Square, you've got those moments where you see the chimney appearing between the trees, and you want to make sure you retain all those moments. Yeah. And, the, and the, the, it, pe people had a genuine affection for it. It was almost its failure was what made it lovable, mm. um, why we loved it so much, because it was so morose. Yes, I, I agree. I agree. And, you know, there's always, you know, there's always, always a love for those kind of failure moments. I think we all love the soft spot for, but, you know, at the same time, we want to make sure we give it life for the next 100 years or 200 years. So we needed to find a sustainable way of transforming. But I think one of the magic thing anyway, is this building is, was well known by everybody from the outside. And actually, you couldn't even get close to it for years because when it was in use, nobody was able to go there. And when it was disused, even worse, you had a big perimeter fence around it. And, uh, but very few people knew the building inside because you know, if you were not working there and there were probably only 200, 250 people working there, nobody would have been able to see the building. So one of the great things about the project is actually now people can come inside and up to 5 million people have come already. So this is already kind of a victory to, to bring it to the London other building, to give it back to them really, to give it back to them inside. I'm sure there are plenty of questions for Sebastian. Who has a question? Hello. Oh um, good evening. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, you worked on an incredible, and beautiful project. And but I have a question with regarding the, let's say, programmatic aspect of it because you talked about sustainability, and kind of reflecting on the last ten years, um, we have seen we have seen projects that rethought uh, industrial spaces of different scales in. Uh, relation, kind of bringing in maker spaces, educational spaces, um, culture, sports, and then kind of especially in the aftermath of the pandemic, there is a feeling that uh, bringing in this amount of retail, uh, especially to the most accessible and open spaces on the first two, three floors with offices being so isolated, with Resi being on the kind of luxury end of the spectrum, um, isn't it a bit of a lost opportunity working with retail? Um, was there a discussion during the project uh, about the long-term um, effect of that or maybe about the future-proofness of this decision? Um, yes, very much a lot of uh, very in-depth discussion on it. I think. This, I mean, when I mention all the activity in this building, this is I mean, one thing which we can be all proud of. This is a very real scheme, a uh, real uh, mixed-use scheme in the noble sense of the term. In other words, the quantum of each activity in there is phenomenal. You know, I mentioned the scale of the office pair component, the scale of the retail component, all of that under one roof in central London. So effectively, where within a very small perimeter, you can recreate, live, 
uh, work is actually, I think, the, what the future is about. So the mixed activity in there, I think, are the right one. It needs to be sustainable. So undertaking a restoration work like this one is phenomenal. So, you know, I think we need to be really proud and pleased that actually some Malaysian investor decided to invest in there because there must have been a lot of romanticism in their approach to it and not only the pure economical factor because this is major, major uh, uh, investment and long-term investment because yeah. before you get to return. So I think, I think it needs, you need to find the Angration which help to, to, to make it viable and actually being sustainable is being viable too because I think that's the real sustainability is doing something which can sustain itself for the future. We've, you know, so that's the real sustainability. And of course it needs, to, it needs to function with the less energy as possible. It needs to have the right ingredient in it. But this zone had no retail, no people living. I mean, this was derelict for four years, all that zone of London. And now it's super vibrant with, you know, a new tube stop. So allowing people to come straight here without having to take a car and all that. So I think it's an incredibly success story from a sustainability point of view. Could it have been something else? If, if I mean, you know, it's often said, well, it could have been a museum, mm -hmm. for example. Could it, have been a, could it have been something else? And if future generations decide that they want to use it for something else, is that possible? I think that's a very good point. I think the, the structure inside the building is super flexible. I mean, as I kind of alluded to, when you look at the retail area or the office space, is a series of great columns, so you can really play with it quite a lot. So you could bring new function later on down the line. Uh, but, I mean, there's one thing uh, maybe worth mentioning and, and which come around the theme of the conversation. Uh, we've done a credible complex intervention to this building and to historic fabric. The amount of modification we've done to a grade two star listed building is pretty much un unheard of. You know, it's very unusual for historic England to accept that amount of change on, the, on, the, on an external facade of, of a listed building. And the reason uh, that probably was accepted and, 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 and encouraged with them is because this is the big challenge that we're all facing. You know, and let's not forget, this is a 20th century industrial building listed, uh, which is, you know, all the nice castles and churches of the Middle Ages, 18th century, 17th century, they've all been taken care of, they've all been restored. But the big challenge for the historic bodies is what do you do with this amazing heritage, which is the 20th century building, which are typically commercial or industrial building. And the problem is, yes, you might be able to do one take modern per city or per big capital, but you can't fund uh, 20 or 30 uh, cultural building of that scale. And the Tate Monet, Bonnet, by the way, is a third of the size of that building. So you need to find other function and demonstrate that you can make a successful story of restoring and, and converting a post station. And the big challenge is all those buildings are heavily contaminated. So just the decontamination is a massive cost. Then they are typically designed for machine without any natural light. So you need to bring some natural light, which is not easy to do in a very big undertaking. And also, you, you end up uh, having buildings which are typically very badly mented throughout their life and very often stay 20 years without being used. So they are in a very poor state. So if we are not careful and if we are romantized too much about what would be the ideal activity to put in there, but don't have fundamental approach of understanding the, the undertake you know, the, the undertaking of dealing with a, a piece of infrastructure like that, uh, we are in great danger that a lot of them will be demolished even if they are listed because nobody will have the, the shoulder to take, the, to take on the challenge of, of restoring them. There's another question here. Hello, my name is Zena James. Uh, Art Deco is a 20th century style, one uh, extremely beautiful decorative style. How did you decide that to break that distinct basic idea of verticality of that building into horizontal elements? The other question is also you changed uh, the, the spirit of that dark red brick with all kinds of granite blocks and that uh, sort of staircase which you showed in the beginning was kind of a very, very different from the style of the building and you used granite, which is quite different. So what I'm trying to ask is 
what made you decide to change more or less than Art Deco? Obviously, it, it has to become modern and it has to be modernized, but what made you decide to change more or less the style and uh, thinking of the design of that building? Did you change the style? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's an interesting thing because I don't think the building is fully Art Deco. The building is, is uh, actually, uh, the turbine Olay is very much Art Deco, the inside of turbine Olay. The external fabric I don't think is partly Art Deco but not fully Art Deco. It's quite a brutalist architecture. And actually turbine Olay, it's very much of the modernist era, uh, post Second War. So there is a, already a collection of eclectic architecture in the building itself. Um, so I don't think you, we, you can be purist and try to mimic a style because there is a, already a combination of style in the building itself. The other thing is, we don't do pastiche architecture as architects. That's not our philosophy. And we do deal with a lot of listed fabric, a lot of, um, and, and our approach to listed fabric is usually when a building is listed, it's because it was an incredibly innovative contemporary building at its time. And that's why it get listed, because it represents a very avant-garde approach of its time. And our attitude to that as architect, I mean, us as a practice with Quintanaire, is to say, well, if this building was so special, you don't want to respond to it by buying pastiche, by being pastiche. If you're pastiche, you're actually not uh, creating the best architecture and the best response you could do. So best approach is to actually try to see how you can be very um, innovative and creative and using technology and vocabulary of contemporary nature to best respond and respect the historic fabric. So we never had that problem of, of kind of, uh, and, and don't, I don't think we've break, broken the verticality of the building. I think we've tried to replace that. Yeah. Hello. Uh, it was very interesting, especially for me, uh, to hear that this building was listed. And for me, it is interesting is it's still listed after all this repairing. And another question, it's about how it was difficult to make such big, difficult, amazing project especially from the side that it was listed. And is it, uh, is you believe that it is easy to continue working this way, especially with listed buildings that was uh, unused uh, for ages or for decades? And how many people work on it? How many contractors do you have? And like, if someone could repeat your, your amazing work in, in future, because as I know here, it's quite difficult to work with listed project, with listed building, and to change anything at least, <laughs> not like in this scale of the project yeah. even. Well, it, it, I hope I got your, your question right. Uh, hopefully, this is, this is just helping to realize that it's possible to convert a building of that scale and that, and that original use into something totally different. So. If we manage to achieve that and to convince other people, that's, that's great. Uh, it's, it's not easy, it's, it's complex, but I think the, the society is evolve, evolving a lot toward those typology of projects. So what used to be seen as not economically viable because of all the constraints we have for all the right reasons now of making sure that we justify the, the embodied carbon in any construction we do, you know, demonstrating that you've studied any opportunity of reusing what you have on site before you demolish and you start again a new development, I think that will motivate and, and force more people to think that way. I mean, this is the future. Being able to reuse as much as we have, uh, hopefully will become more and more and more viable. I hope I've responded to your question. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. There's someone here. I promise I'll keep it brief. I live in the area and I just love looking at it, so thank you. It's amazing to live across the river from it. Um, I would like to ask a very simple question. What was the starting budget and what was the final budget? <laughs> yes. Uh, so I'm, I'm just I'm gonna be I'm gonna become a bit of a political character there I think by answering it because I would be told off by uh, by your client if I was uh, it was if I was mentioning all the figure we went through across the the project the I think if we if anybody knew exactly what was going to be the cost at the beginning of the project probably maybe the project would have never happened <laughs> but at the same time if 
The same people knew the value which was going to be created on the project at the beginning. Uh, you know, people didn't know that. I mean, the fact that Apple took 45,000 square meters of offices in that space uh, is just phenomenal and totally transformed the value of that area. The fact that the tube has opened means that this site is now requalified as Zone 1. The, the overall master plan, which was based uh, back in 2011-2013 as an 80% residential-led master plan and 20% commercial, is now totally transformed into a 50-50% uh, office versus resi, which is a very exciting thing because it means that that zone is now requalified as a working environment, a place where people want to work. So the, the value created by the project is phenomenal. So I think the official figure is about £1.7 billion pound for the construction costs of the poor station. Those are the official figure. So it's around that figure. Uh, I don't know the overall master plan cost, which is enormous. It just remains for me to thank you very much, Sebastian. It's an absolutely fascinating evening. Well, thank you for coming. Lecture. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you.